Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring premonitions of disaster. My guest is Eric Wargo, who is the author of Time Loops, Precognition, Retrocognition, and the Unconscious. He is an anthropologist, and he also hosts a blog called The Nightshirt. This, once again, is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. I think you'll find the quality of these videos is improving. Welcome, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, hello again. It's, uh, it's great to be on the show again. Well, in your book, Time Loops, you look at a number of different disasters uh, and the ways in which it does appear that uh, some individuals have had very vivid, detailed premonitions regarding these disasters. And it's certainly, in some cases, people uh, people's lives were saved. Yeah, sometimes uh, it, there, the number of cases... Yeah, there are cases where where people will dream of a disaster and then take be able to take action, uh, like at the last minute. Like for instance, uh, there are cases in automobiles where you know you have a vision of a of a of an accident or or whatever, and you and suddenly you come to that intersection and oh my god, I dreamed this, and you and you're suddenly on your guard and you take uh, take you're able to take evasive action or something like, like that and avert uh, the the calamity. Much more frequent is, however, is the pattern of just dreaming of something terrible happening that uh, you really you're unable to avert. A, because you don't realize it's a premonition. B, because, well, it does seem like something terrible is going to happen, but, but you don't know when and where. You know, the details are missing. Uh, and... Uh, you know, you know, and who would you call? <laughs> you know, what would you, what, what action in real life could you take if you have a dream, say, about a uh, a plane crash, for instance? You know, plane crash dreams are very, very, uh, very, very common in the literature, and um, uh, but very often they're, you know, the you know, you, you may have a a person may have a very vivid picture of what happens, um, but they can't. You know, even if they even if they have, there are even cases where dreamers sometimes identify the airline uh, or the city where it's going to occur, but they don't know when and what. You know, what would they do if they called an authority? You know, what what would an authority do <laughs> with you know with a, with someone mm -hmm. saying you know, hey, I had a dream that uh, uh, you know. So it's the, the and that and this troubles people. This troubles mm -hmm. people who have these dreams that. Uh, they, they, uh, it feels like, well, if I dreamed about this disaster, it means I should have somehow been able to take action and prevent it. And I believe that that emotion, uh, I argue in the book that that emotion is actually folded into the signal that, that refluxes back in time. And that actually, you can sometimes identify that, that feeling or that idea as kind of part of the, uh, the symbolic representation uh, mm -hmm. of the dream itself. Well, in, in our prior interview about time loops, we talked about how an event uh, in the future, in, in effect, through retrocognition or retrocausality, can create itself, bring itself into being. I, they do work that way, I think. The, the, and that, and this, in a way, it accounts often for some of the, 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 the ways a dream, for instance, or a premonition will deviate from the event that occurs. You know, very commonly, a person will dream that they die in a disaster. Uh, and then it turns out, you know, they maybe you know, take a different flight or whatever, and the plane crashes. So they didn't die, but the plane did crash. And what I argue is that what they're, what they're dreaming about is not the event as such, not the event in the future, like the plane crashing. They're dreaming of their own thoughts, their own troubled uh, 
disturbed, excited, uh, relieved, guilty, all this mix of emotions, this very complex mix of emotions is what gets sort of refluxes back in time and informs a dream uh, leading up to an event. Uh, let me give you an example. I mean, one of the, uh, in the, uh, in the early 60s, uh, Ian Stevenson collected uh, a, a number of, of cases of apparent uh, premonitions around the Titanic disaster. And one of them was a man named J. Conan Middleton, who had started starting about 10 days before the disaster. He was, he was scheduled to be on the boat. And he had purchased his ticket. He was going uh, to New York on a business trip. And he, about 10 days beforehand, he, he fell into a deep depression and uh, couldn't sleep. And he kept having these recurring dreams of being in the water surrounded by people drowning. And, 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 uh, and he just, yeah, this terrible feeling that this, you know, that this trip was going to be a disaster. Well, uh, he, uh, he received a telegram from his business associates in New York saying, oh, you don't come, you know, wait, put off your, your trip. And he was very relieved. Okay. Yeah, fine. You know, he, he, he wasn't, he was a, he wasn't about to change his plans based on a dream. You know, uh, the history of, of ESP is full of, of men who refuse to <laughs> change their plans just because they had a dream and, and <laughs> their wives will encourage them to, but like, no, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And anyway, in this case, fate, saved him, essentially, uh, from that death. I would hypothesize he dreamed this because uh, it was, this disaster was connected to him. It could have been him. You know, and that's the thought that would, that, that, that would happen, that, that you would have uh, yeah. on, uh, geez, I could have been on that, you know, I should have been on that boat. You know, I would be dead now. You know, um, th it's that thought, but I survived that I think is the key to premonitions because premonitions, when you, most premonitions, when you really drill down and, and, and examine them, they're not about a disaster. They're about your own survival and the mixed emotions uh, around your survival of, of somebody else's so, you know, some disaster befalling somebody else or a disaster that should have, you know, or could very easily have involved you or that was connected to you in some, in some way. You know, I'm getting chills down my spine right now as you're speaking. The reason is because I, I have had in my life a series of repetitive dreams about airplane crashes I never understood why, because I've never had any direct involvement. I've had indirect involvement with airplane crashes. It, it dawned on me on one occasion, I took a flight from Cairo to New York on Egypt Air. Well, one week later, the very same flight did crash and, and everyone was killed. And in fact, the suggestion was that the co-pilot deliberately crashed the plane because of the flight recorder has him saying, um, you know, something like God is great as the plane is going down. And, and you actually, you specifically, you think you dreamed about that? Well, and now that, and as you were speaking about it, because I was on that very same airplane one week earlier. That well, I think this is a a, a very a very common mm -hmm. pattern, and and it it accounts not only for disaster uh, premonitions, but it sort of then links like disaster dreams and disaster premonitions to the kind of broader uh, phenomenon that Frederick Myers uh, was writing about, you know, in the in the late eighteen hundreds. Uh, which of course he had the, his rubric was telepathy. That's sort of his, that was his kind of theoretical construct to understand uh, these things. You know, it's another very common uh, type of dream is dreaming about the death or a crisis involving a loved one. You know, 
Uh, and as I was just, as I was talking about, uh, Jay Conan Middleton's dream about the Titanic, it just occurred to me that, wow, this is the same situation basically as, uh, Mark Twain. His, uh, uh, very famously, he had a dream when he was 20, 23 years old, uh, and he was working on a, on a, uh, a riverboat on the Mississippi River. Uh, he had a dream, uh, they, they were, he was ashore with his brother, his younger brother, uh, who was 19 at the time. Uh, and he had invite he had uh, invited his brother to come and work with him on this on this steamboat called the Pennsylvania, I believe. And uh, well, he had this dream while they were both staying with their sister and uh, their sister's husband um, in St. Louis, I think. And he had a dream, very vivid dream, of his brother laid out in a metal casket, wearing one of a borrowed suit, one of his own suits, and someone laying, or, and, and a bouquet of white roses and a single red rose on it, and the, and the ca- casket was laid on two chairs. Very vivid dream. Uh, he claimed after the fact that he actually thought this was real, and he went out to even to, to go visit the body and realize, oh, this was just a dream. I think that was kind of an, uh, a writer's sort of elaboration of, of this after the fact. But in any case... A few weeks later, uh, they they shipped out together on this boat, went south to New Orleans, and it was uh, and he had a fight. He had a fight with the the ship's pilot. They were like constantly getting into the arguments, and the pilot told made him stay ashore for their for the uh, the run back north. Uh, so uh, he was uh, so he didn't take he he wasn't on the boat. And then the boiler exploded uh, somewhere on the river, killing hundreds of people uh, and uh, mortally injuring Henry, his brother. And so he, you know, he hurried as quick as he could to uh, to the bedside of his brother, who was, uh, uh, and and I think he actually wound up dying of, of morphine. I think a morphine overdose given by the nurse uh-huh. or the doctors. But um, in any case. After he died, he went uh, the next. He, he showed up, and they were had, there was a big room where they were laying out the dead in ca- in caskets, and they were all pine caskets except for one metal casket, uh, which contained the body of his brother Henry, who was wearing a suit that had, that he that Henry had borrowed from Mark Twain without his knowledge. Okay, uh, and just as he's, you know viewing this this astonishing scene uh a nurse comes in and puts a a bouquet of white roses on henry's chest and it has a single red rose you know just just like in his dream and it turned out that uh the he had henry had displayed such stoicism uh you know enduring his burns and and so forth that the nurses had pitched in uh from their paychecks to buy him a metal casket you know, that's, that's why he had a metal casket instead of a plain pine casket. And then a few days later, uh, I think at the funeral or wake or something like that, uh, the casket was sitting on two chairs, just also as he'd seen in the dream. So, but there again, see, Mark Twain should have been on that boat, you know? So, I mean, we always, this is a very classic dream in the literature and people think, well, this is a classic, uh, premonition of death, premonition of, of his brother's death. And I think that kind of misses the point here. It's a premonition of his own survival. And all those feelings that one has in that situation, you know, first of all, obviously, there's grief. You know, grief, obviously, there's grief. But also along with that grief, there's guilt. I mean, he was only, Henry was only working on that boat because Mark had, you know, Samuel Clemens at that point had invited him (laughs) Uh, you know, and, and gotten him a job there. So he basically, he was responsible for his little brother getting killed. Okay. Mm. And, uh, but then relief, you know, like who doesn't, who's not going to feel this like, oh my God, that could have been, you know, could have been me. I should have been on that boat. So there's both their survivor's guilt, but there's, you know, we're, we're, we can't help we're we're animals deep down and you know when you when uh uh we survive something that others have not survived we feel also uh re- relief i mean some deep uh 
organismic part of us, you know, our, our lizard brain or whatever you want to call it, you know, is going to feel uh, very, very uh, rewarded uh, or relieved by that, by that fact. Uh, Aristotle said, luck is when the guy next to you gets hit by the arrow. Hmm. And, and, and I think that's key because it's like a luck is not just, well, not getting hit by an arrow. It's, it's when someone else gets hit by an arrow and that, wow, that frames, that fact frames your own survival, right? It surve- mm. it frames your own, uh, you know, being alive in a very profound way. And I think it's that, it's that mix of emotions that, mm. uh, that are really the kind of the, the carrier wave, if you want to put it that way, of, of, of premonitory experiences. But it, 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 like I said, it's, this is, I, this situation hadn't occurred to me, but the situation is just exactly like the, the Middleton, you know, dreams, you know, I, I should have been on that boat, <laughs> you know, and, and thus he has a, a, a premonitory dream. Probably the most famous example of a, a premonition of a disaster would be Robertson's novel, Futility, that uh, dealt with the sinking of a giant ocean liner, largest ever built, named the Titan. That's right. Yep. In 1898, uh, Morgan yeah. Robertson was, he was a really interesting character. He was a, we don't know that much about him, but he was a a, a writer of sort of uh, I don't. I think that was before the pulps, but it was you know sort of cheap uh, adventure stories and science fiction stories and uh, and stories about about the sea for the for the most part because he had he had spent I think a decade of his life as a young man he'd sort of run away from home I think at age sixteen or something like that and he'd gone to work uh, as a, uh, a seaman uh, and and so but he. Uh, and so he, you know, later in his life, he sort of struggled to find a career and uh, various things didn't work out, but he found that he could, he had a talent for spinning a good yarn. And so he, uh, he became a writer and became a fairly successful one in the 1890s. And, uh, and so, yeah, he wrote this novella in 1898 called, called Futility. Uh, it was later renamed, and so you'll typically see it as futility, the wreck of the Titan, but they only added the wreck of the Titan after the Titanic sank in 1912, uh, to boost, you know, to like, Hey, you know, here's a, uh, way to market this, <laughs> the republication of this novel. Um, but yeah, he, he wrote this, this novel, uh, or novella. It's kind of a short novel about, uh, this, um, it's not, it's really not about, a disaster so much. And that's sort of the, the inciting incident in this, in this story. Um, but it's about a, 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 an alcoholic seaman working on, on this boat, sort of a, a, a an autobiographical, you know, his, his narrators or his, his protagonists were always sort of versions of himself. I mean, he was, a he was, he struggled, struggled with alcohol addiction his whole life. Uh, Anyway, he, it's about this this character on on this biggest ever ocean liner called the Titan. It's making its third voyage uh, uh, between Liverpool and and New York. Sorry, between New York, going from New York to Liverpool in this case, um, and uh, collides with an iceberg on an April night and goes down. There aren't enough lifeboats, although that's there's kind of an inconsistency in the story. I mean, it's like everyone dies, uh, even you, you, like all but 13 people <laughs> die. I think only one lifeboat gets away or whatever, but, uh, uh, yeah. So 14 years later, <clears throat> the Titanic sinks, uh, and yeah, people like, Whoa, I mean, all the, 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 the stats, you know, lots of people have looked at, at the, the case of the statistics of the boats and, and all the facts about the speed they were going and, and where the iceberg hit, all these details match up, you know, very closely. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting case because it's been, it's been picked over by, <clears throat> by skeptics, as you can imagine, uh, endlessly. Uh, and the skeptics have good points. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's, I love this, I love this case because there's so many, uh, wrinkles to it and it is, and it is very hard to come down firmly on one side or the other. Um, the skeptics have 
good points. Uh, for instance, Martin Gardner, the famous skeptic, uh, wrote a book sort of trying to debunk this by uh, showing, well, first of all, if you're a writer of Sea Adventures uh, and you want to write a, a story about the biggest ocean liner ever, it's not all that hard to extrapolate from the existing ocean liners of the, of the time he was writing and come up with a boat that pretty much matches uh, his Titan uh, in the story or the, the real life Titanic. So there's, you know, how, how, you know, how much of a coincidence is that? Maybe not much. Um, if you're going to put, you know, the element of corporate, hubris in your story you're gonna make too few lifeboats but this was already indeed it was already an issue people writers were already warning of this of this pattern of not having enough lifeboats on on boats i mean this was already uh, an issue uh one of the other people who had who could have maybe written about it beforehand and who died on the on the uh on, on the Titanic, uh, W.T. Stead, a journalist in London, uh, he had already written like uh, editorials about the issue of not having enough lifeboats on, on ocean liners. Um, so, okay, you know, how much of a coincidence is that? The name thing is what it comes down to, I think, for, for most people. Uh, Martin Gardner didn't think it was that that crazy that, well, you know, the White Star Line had, you know, they had a uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember all the names of their boats, but he sort of listed them. He said, well, Titan Titanic is the obvious one for the next boat. You know, there's no, <laughs> you know, uh, and so Martin, uh, or I'm sorry, so uh, Morgan Robertson would have naturally picked Titanic, but he would have dropped the ick, the ick from the end, so he wouldn't make it too close to the White Star <laughs> stuff. I mean, it goes through a lot of, you know. Speculation. Speculation, right, which is. It's fine. I mean, we, I, you know, you have to speculate because you don't always have the, you know, all the pieces of the, of, uh, of data that you would like. So I, I, I forgive him. That. But there's a lot more uh, nuances to this case that uh, Martin Gardner either ignored or was unaware of that uh, really put it in the firmly in the, yeah, it was premonition uh, category. First of all, the fact that this is such a common pattern with writers, uh, especially writers of imaginative fiction. I mean, this is, this is, uh, it's, it's, this is what I've been sort of, uh, delving into, uh, very deeply since I finished time loops is that my sort of follow up book is going to be about, about, uh, sort of literary precognition. And it's just, uh, it's everywhere you turn. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And you have very famous cases of this, like Phil Dick and so forth, but, but, but across the board, imaginative writers, uh, and I think probably all writers, uh, are constantly, you know, precognizing events in their future uh, in their writings. And so it fits a very common pattern, first of all. Uh, but uh, second of all, uh, the, sort of the way that that event sort of fit into his own, into Morgan Robertson's own life uh, is very interesting. And a, uh, a, psychoanalyst, a Freudian psychoanalyst and parapsychologist named Jewel Eisenbud wrote about this case in the early 80s in a book. Uh, it's an article and sort of a collected uh, book uh, called uh, uh, Paranormal Foreknowledge, I believe is the name of the book. It's a, a brilliant study of this, of, of Morgan Robertson, sort of a psychoanalytic uh, study of Morgan Robertson. <laughs> and um, and he hit Eisenbutt really hit on some really key things about Robertson and his personality, which even further kind of put him in this club of highly precognitive, highly neurotic writers. I mean, he goes right along with Phil Dick as one of these uh, one of these uh, people who really had a hard time. Uh, managing reality, you know, uh, and, uh, suffered from a, an addiction, lifelong addiction, alcohol in, in Morgan Robertson's case, uh, and also had a deep psychological need for something like the block universe, something like a universe in which there really is no free will. Uh, and this seems, this seems to be a pattern in in 
precognitive writers and precognitive individuals, a, a, or people who are, who outwardly express, uh, uh, this kind of precognitive gift is, uh, kind of a need for absolution that comes along with a block universe in which there's no, the, the ruination that they've made of their life, whether it's because of some sort of drug addiction or some other source of guilt, it's not their fault. Mm. And, uh, and so Jewel Eisenberg really keyed in on this really interesting uh, feature of Morgan Robertson. And in fact, makes a good case uh, that there may be more to it than just alcohol addiction in Robertson's case. Uh, uh, he sort of kind of speculates in, the, in a kind of typical Freudian way that there may be, not, not only was there a really deep Oedipus complex there, but, uh, but that uh, there may have been uh, some kind of latent, you know, homosexuality or something, some sort of, uh, some sort of sexual desire that was at the time really forbidden and very, and very painful for uh for morgan robinson to deal with and that maybe he would you know maybe the alcohol was connected with that who knows i mean it's it, it, yes you do get into speculation always in this with this topic well, let me just try and unpack what you you said though because it seems crucial and i, I want to make sure our viewers get this you're saying a person like morgan robertson whose life is a mess uh, he's got an addiction. He's got financial troubles. Um, things aren't working well for him in, in his relationships. And so in order to um, come to terms with the, the way his life is working out, he, he wants to believe that he has no choice, that everything was already ordained by fate, which would be a block universe. And to prove that uh, by being uh, having accurate precognitions, that assumes, in effect, that that the future exists somewhere in that block universe, and it cannot be altered. And so, therefore, in spite of their terrible life, they're absolved in some way. Exactly. And and the funny thing is, uh, okay. when you actually go and re read this novel, Futility, the the ice in the story. It's precisely what you just said, the, this sort of, you know, Im fate is being immutable, you can't do anything about it. The, the main character is delivering this angry soliloquy about exactly that issue on the, like, on the deck of this, of, of the, of the Titan, right as the, the, uh, the iceberg looms out of the fog and destroys the ship. I mean, it's like right at that moment, you know, uh, the ship is destroyed as he's, you know, as he's railing against the immutability of fate. It's like it's, he delivers it as a complaint, but you can sort of tell that underneath it all, it's, uh, you know, that this is the, you know, Robertson was complaining about this throughout his writings that, you know, immutable faith, there's no God, uh, and yet, uh, you know, causality is, is locks us in and there's nothing you can do about it. So it's sort of this, this kind of existential, you know, you know, waving your fist, but, but underneath it all, uh, you kind of sense that, uh, that, well, if that's the way reality is, um, it kind of forgives all the bad stuff that that happened in his life and that he did and and so forth and in fact this in this the story is about him being accused of of molesting the this girl that he rescues from the ship uh and who's the daughter of his ex you know this this woman he once loved and 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 uh but then the at the end this trial you know every, they find that no he was saving her from polar bears and all this stuff on you know they actually sail away on the iceberg and and he oh. has to kill a polar bear with his bare hands and and stuff it's just it's you know it's not a great novel but uh <laughs> well you do point out that Robertson has had uh, had a series of other uh, precognitive experiences. It's not just this novel. Yeah, he had a reputation for this. That's another, you know, that's another detail here, a biographical detail that was sort of ignored, that's ignored by the skeptics. You know, he had a pattern of doing this. And so isn't it odd that someone with already who had a pattern of, of, of sort of uh, kind of precognitive experiences in his writing, but also in his life. He was kind of regarded by his friends as this kind of uh, psychic person. And, and he was always having these, he was sort of guided 
uh, by what we would now call synchronicity, and this is before synchronicity was ever coined by Carl Jung. But you know, he was sort of guided by this. It was it was it was it was a big part of his worldview. And then, boom, he's you know, I, I think he was fifty about the uh, in 1915 when you know the New York Times you know news headline was the Titanic hits an iceberg and and uh, goes down. And it's like that. Uh, you know, he already was known for this. But the thing is, by that point, he was already uh, very much washed up and, and forgotten. I mean, he was, he had sort of descended into, you know, he was, he, he wrote this very kind of sad uh, autobiographical memoir for, I think it was Harper's Magazine or something. I don't know. It, it, uh, it was anonymous. He wrote it anonymously, but it's just, you know, he just, he was someone who just couldn't make things work in his life, as you said. And, and, uh, you know, couldn't provide for his wife, couldn't, um, you know, and, and couldn't beat his addiction. He tried, uh, seemingly on a few occasions to, to, uh, to beat his alcohol addiction, but couldn't. Um, and in fact, he was, he died in 1915, just a couple years after the, uh, Titanic disaster. He was found standing up. He was dead, found standing up in his, uh, uh Atlantic city, New Jersey, uh, hotel room. And uh, he was probably there trying to detox from alcohol, uh, because he had, he, he had some medicine, uh, on his cabinet that was at that time used, uh, to treat, uh, alcohol addiction. So yeah, it's a very sad, sad story of, of someone who just sort of couldn't fit into his life. And, uh, but you know, like a lot of very neurotic, um, people, he did, you know, he did, managed to channel this, uh, into stories and he did have a career, you know, and, and he actually isn't totally forgotten. You know, it's like, you can, uh, still buy his books. And of course he, that it's, that novel is now, you know, quite famous because of, uh, because of the, the remarkable, you know, precognitive feat. But the point is it was, you know, it was just the most best known case in several mm-hmm. in his life, uh, he had a pattern of doing this. He fits into the pattern of other writers who have shown this, uh, in their lives. Um, so, you know, it, it, that adds very much, it kind of misses the point to focus in on the details of the tonnage of the ship and all that, you know, you're kind of missing the, the, the forest for the, or missing the forest for the trees. Uh, when you do that, uh, there's, you know, a lot that adds up to a pretty compelling case, I think. Another very interesting uh, disaster uh, took place many years ago, the Aberfan mine disaster that uh, some researchers attempted to really seek out premonitions in in that case. And they found, I guess, many dozen. Yes, um, that was the Aberfan. It was Aberfan, Wales. uh, And this is in the mid 60s. And uh, very, you know, just a horribly tragic case. case where a school in this village was completely buried under uh, uh, mud, I guess, mine tailings uh, from a mine up on the, on the hill above and like water had seeped in and, uh, and it all flooded in, it flowed into the town. Um, some of the kids had had, uh, it turned out, okay, when this happened, um, uh, Some people reported, you know, having, you know, had a telepathic or premonitory vision about it. So uh, this man named John Barker, who was sort of interested in in this kind of thing, uh, decided to try and solicit. He he got the help of a of a science writer friend of his to help solicit uh, stories of premonitions of the disaster uh, from around Britain, and they got a lot of letters and I think they got, they wound up with, I think something like 60, uh, 60 cases of, of premonitory, uh, dreams about the disaster, uh, from, uh, not only from Aberfan, but from Britain in general, uh, a couple of the kids who were killed in the disaster, uh, had, it turned out their parents reported that they had told them of their premonitions. There was one girl, uh, Errol May Jones, I believe was her name, uh, who, uh, her, the night before the disaster, she, she, she dreamed that something black came down 
over the school. Uh, and I think she, there's something, the word, the end or something like that, or maybe that was another kid. But anyway, a couple of the kids had these experiences and their parents reported them, uh, afterwards. Um, so this, uh, uh, was fascinating to John Barker, who was already interested in this phenomenon. He, his special interest, there's actually, there's a brand new, really good article in, in the New Yorker, uh, about him, uh, but his special interest was uh, in in people who sort of have a premonition of, of their death or whatever, and then and then die, sort of with the idea that well maybe the premonition causes you know the death. That there's some sort of causative role mm-hmm. there, and 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 very famously, some of the psychics he worked with uh, predicted his death and then he wound up dying. Uh, so it's, and sorting all that out, you know, well, what's causative and what's, uh, precognition is a, is itself a very interesting, uh, question. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting case. And that too is one that has been sort of picked over by skeptics and, and so forth. And, uh, uh, but it's very, yeah, it's a very sad, sad story. Well, what do you make of it in terms of your uh, model of time loops? Well, it's the same thing. You know, it's uh, people read about, uh, well, leaving aside the people who are directly involved, who are in the village. I mean, you know, they're connected to it, but just people in the, in the wider Great Britain who woke up one morning to read this, you know, horrible news story um, about children dying, you know, being children being smothered. You know, that's exactly the kind of uh, heart wrenching kind of story that I think uh, is is gonna again reflux. <laughs> you know, if, if there's any kind of story that's gonna reflux back in 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 your brain uh, and and spark some kind of experience, at least in people who are sensitive to that kind of thing, uh, it's a story like that. Um, and uh, you know, it's that's it's, that's a People dying, you know, untimely deaths is a mm-hmm. is a real, um, real prevalent. Okay, because your your model uh, basically is that people are precognizing their own mind when they learn about the news. So when they learn about this news, many people are going to be in a heightened emotional state, which is, uh, according to a fascinating book by Andrea Puharich, Beyond Telepathy, he's suggesting that telepathic transmission requires an emotional arousal or even a physiological arousal. Uh, which would be the same, I suppose, in terms of sending yourself a precognitive message. If you're aroused in, in some way, emotionally, physiologically, you're going to be a better sender, even to yourself. Right. And this, is, uh, this goes back, actually, to Frederick Myers, who we were talking about earlier. He's, it was his, uh, his theory that, that, uh, that powerful emotions, strong emotions, uh, are the power of the telepathic signal, you know, and of course the metaphor here, there's a, there's a, there's a metaphor going on here that of, uh, of the, the telecommunication, telecommunications technologies of the time, right? I mean, Myers was, uh, working in the time of the telegraph. Mm. Uh, uh, in fact, Mark Twain is an aside. He actually wrote a, an article about mental telegraphy. He sort of identified the same phenomenon that Myers had, and he called it mental telegraphy. And he had a lot of examples in his own life of this kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and then of course the me- the metaphor shifted in the early uh, parts of the century. Of course, radio became an even more obvious uh, metaphor for understanding uh, these kinds of phenomena. So uh, you know, uh, uh, Upton Sinclair, of course, wrote his classic book mental radio about the experiments the telepathy experiments that he did with his uh his wife mary craig kimbra and uh and so yes there's there's this idea that trauma or powerful emotions is sort of the power uh that sends the signal now what i'm suggesting is that a lot of these cases that may look like telepathy uh, that's just sort of an easy way of understanding this you know someone's in pain they send they radiate a signal um, it may be, in fact, our own emotions that we're, that we're keying in on and that there are our own future emotions. So it's, it's harder to sort of wrap your head around that idea of communicating with yourself across time. 
But when you get back to the, you know, the understanding of, of space time in the Einsteinian universe and the, the sort of the block universe idea of Minkowski, uh, we're all world lines. <clears throat> you know, we're all, uh, we're four dimensional creatures and our four, and that four dimensional form is kind of like a worm. You know, it's extending through that glass block and our brain is like a worm. It's, ex- it's extending from birth to death, right? And, uh, sort of a fat, you know, squishy, you know, roughly a diameter worm that extends, you know, ideally several decades through that block. If we could see ourselves in four dimensions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the argument I'm making is that the evidence points, we don't know how it works yet, but the evidence points toward the brain or towards nervous systems in general, not just the human brain being essentially tesseracts. Uh, that is to say four dimensional uh, objects that are actually con- uh, conducting information across the fourth dimension, yeah. you know, uh, and thus, uh, you know, brain connectivity, if you will, you, we can't just understand it in three dimensions. It's already you know, the most complicated, f- complex object known in the universe, right? Just in three dimensions, but then multiply that by a fourth dimension. Uh, but, the 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 you know the evidence is mounting uh, from quantum biology and 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 various fields of research. Uh, you know, my money is certainly that that you know in a couple decades it'll be widely recognized that the brain is a quantum computer, um, and that its computation is uh, way more. Uh, uh, it transcends the, th- <laughs> the three dimensions that we're used to, uh, mm-hmm. and that, that that would account for then the its ability to communicate with itself across time. But yeah, it's gonna it's it it's still nevertheless the case that those powerful emotions seem to be, you know, somehow what we're, uh, you know, what we're we're responding to or what. Uh, you know, you can think of it as powering a signal, but I don't, I don't, that's not the way I, I like to think of it. I think of it more as kind of a, um, a carrier wave almost, uh, is that, is that, that, uh, that emotional energy. And yeah, we, that's a, that's a metaphor. It's not, but you know, we, that's the best we can do is, is think with these sort of crude metaphors. I noted, uh, going through your book that you had, I guess we'd have to call it a premonition regarding, uh, the nine 11 disaster. And, uh, you analyzed it actually in, in terms of Freudian psychology. I thought it was quite interesting. I, I almost wouldn't even call it a premonition because it was not like a typical premonition that I, it, it seemed like a warning or, or anything like that. It was just a typical dream. <clears throat> I happen to be in the habit of recording my dreams and I have for, uh, for a couple decades now. And, uh, and so, you know, I woke up on the morning of, of that morning and I just jotted down on, on the pad next to my bed you know, uh, 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 what I could remember of a dream the previous night, it didn't seem significant in any way, any more than any other dream does. Um, and, uh, the dream was specifically that I was driving on a specific road in my hometown, uh, Lakewood, Colorado, where I grew up. And, uh, and there were, I passed by two identical mosques. And they were just very nondescript, just small, uh, one story, very square, completely square, and very and with corrugated gray facades, just 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 plain corrugated gray facades, and uh, a pair of them identical, and and that was it. That's all I that's all I wrote down. <clears throat> no feeling of you know nothing, no feeling of numinosity or anything about about this. Yes. Um, well, then, of course, 9-11 happened, and we were all, I was caught up in the news, as everyone else was for that day, and I don't even know when it was that I went, went back to that dream that I'd jotted down. I'd completely forgotten about it. Do you jot down your dreams every morning? Is Yeah, if I can. Yeah, if I can remember them. 
uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the best way to do it is to keep a notebook by your bed, jot a few few notes for things that you remember, and then if you have time later in the morning, type you know, look at your notes and type out. Uh, those notes will help jog your memory of the of the complete dream, and then you can write it out. I sort of I, I keep a word file of these of these uh, things when I can. Uh, in any case, now. So I had never, it was only, I don't know if it was later that day or the next day that I remembered that dream. And uh, I thought that is really, it's really weird in a sense. There was no disaster in it. There wasn't, it wasn't like a typical premonition dream where something horrible happens. It was just driving past a pair of mosques, but they happened to have that same court, that same facade of the World Trade Center. And I had never, you know, Islam at that point was not on my radar at all. You know, I was, I had never, in fact, I did a, I did a, at some point I did a, a word search of my, you know, I have you know, thousands of pages of, of dream journals and, you know, I did a word search for words related to mosque or Islam or Muslim, things like that. Nothing. And, and then when I free associated on the dream, something else significant came. And this, you know, this comes back to my, my feeling that, that the guidance Freud gave, you know, over a century ago to looking at dreams is very important. Even if he was not quite right about what dreams are and how they work, he, uh, his method of free association, uh, really is, is crucial. I mean, it, it, it really shows that dreams are, are these, you know, nexuses of associations, uh, that are relevant to our, you know, uh, they may not seem relevant, uh, but the moment you free associate on them, boom, you, you, you get connections that are really, really interesting. And in this case, uh, that specific, the place where they were in the dream was, uh, in actuality, a little, uh, little office building, very little t- one story kind of little medical office building where my father had had his psycho- his clinical psychology practice in, uh, sometime in the late seventies, I believe, or early eighties, not sure. And, uh, and I have ones and it was just briefly, it was just like maybe a year that he had his practice there before he moved to a big bank building nearby. And I have one association with that building and that that's that he came home uh, one night or maybe it was in the morning. Actually, he told us about this. He was called. Uh, he got this sort of emergency call from a patient that he needed really needed to see him bad. You know, and, and this didn't usually happen in my father's life, you know, but he uh, he 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 went and met this patient late at night and it was a rainy night. Uh, and he probably shouldn't have been telling my mom and I about this, but it was, I guess, so strange to my dad that, that, that whatever he violated, you know, his confidentiality rules or whatever, just, he just said that, that it was, a uh, a, uh, I don't know if the patient was what we would call transsexual or, or, or whatever, but he was, it was a man, but he was wearing a dress and he was, and he was in deep pain and he was, uh, contemplating suicide. Basically he was suicidal. And so my father had to sort of talk him down from, uh, from suicide. And, and so, you know, I, it was just a very strange image. I've always kept in my mind, you know, from my father from late in the seventies, uh, but that, it's that, that was associated with that place, which in the dream was replaced by these two mosques that looked, that had that facade of the World Trade Center. Well, that memory, when I reflected on this later, I realized, well, that memory is about, it's about kind of emasculation in a way. It's about, it's about, uh, a, a crisis. It's about suicide. Suicide is wrapped up in that. So this sort of bundle of associations to that dream, is very kind of vividly all the things about that day, you know, that, that occupied us, uh, that, that dominated the airwaves that dominated CNN as we were all watching that it was, it was, you know, Islam and, uh, emasculation, uh, essentially our country had been castrated, you know, in a way by, by these attacks and, uh, and, and the, the, the distinct facades of these mosques, in my dream were, you know, identical to the distinct corrugated facades of the, of the world trade center. So is this a premonition? 
I, you know, I, my, honestly, my hunch is that most Americans probably dreamed about the attacks on 9-11 on the, in, in the days and weeks beforehand. But people don't record their dreams. A, they don't record their dreams. They don't remember them. You know, we don't remember, we, we remember, and even when we do remember our dreams, we remember maybe the dream or two that, that occurred just before we woke up. We don't, you know, we dream two and a half hours a night. You know, there's a lot of, lot of material we're processing uh, during REM sleep and, and actually all sleep, but, but you know, especially the, during REM sleep, you know, but we do not remember these things and we're not necessarily supposed to remember them. You know, this is a, a cognitive metabolist, you know, it's, it's metabolizing our experience in, in some way. Uh, and it's not necessary that it's not necessarily important for us to remember them. I don't think, but uh, in any case, you know, we, we remember and record a t- the teeniest fraction of the dreams that we have on a, on a, on a nightly basis. Uh, and so, yeah, I would, I would guess that a lot of people had such dreams and, uh, uh, many, many, many people reported such dreams. Uh, the Rhine center, uh, uh, that, that, you know, the, uh, JB Rhine's research laboratory, they collect, uh, disaster premonitions. They got more, reports of premonitory dreams and visions and so forth uh, related to 9-11 than any other disaster. Um, I wonder if in in your dream, the fact that the mosques were single story uh, mosques, in, in effect, since there were two identical ones, symbolic of the World Trade Tower, but the, the single story suggests, I guess, uh, another metaphor for emasculation. Exactly, and that was my first uh, my first thought. In fact, even before my, my my sole thought when I wrote down when I jotted down the dream was that there, there were the, the the buildings were distinctly low, and somehow that you know because I I was steeped in sort of Freudian thinking, and I, mm-hmm. I I immediately went to the thought, oh, this is somehow castrated. It was sort of the opposite of tall buildings. There was that somehow that sense that this is the opposite of tall buildings uh, with these buildings. So that was actually my first thought before 9-11 occurred and before, you know, I went back to the dream and realized these other uh, connections to that day. So that was actually my first, uh, my first. Mm. I presume, of course, you didn't take any particular action based on that dream. Exactly. And, and how could I, you know, how could I have a, there was no sense that this was actually uh, any kind of premonition of something going to happen. At that point, Mm -hmm. I had no awareness of precognitive dreaming. This was before, long before I became interested in this topic or aware of it. Um, you know, I had had, you know, in, in hindsight, I had had other dreams that, that were, I would say, precognitive, but I would never have even framed it that way. And I, in fact, mm-hmm. I, I, I swept them under my mental rug, you know, in fact, yeah. even this one, I, when I went back to it, I thought that is really strange. That is really weird, but I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what to do with that. You know, what do you, well, and so you forget about it. And this is a very common, very common pattern with mm-hmm. uh, these kinds of experiences. Uh, they may be very vivid. People have very vivid uh, psychic experiences uh, that are just, you know, very profound. And yet, because they don't have a framework to put them in, they don't, may not know anything about ESP or, or the, they may not come from a culture. So, you know, for, we don't come from a culture that makes a place for, uh, dreaming of future events. And, uh, and so we don't have a, a, a compartment to stick that in. And so it sort of gets, uh, swept aside. Well, Eric, you're, you're dealing with, as you point out, with precognition itself is an incredibly elusive topic. And when you add to it all of the nuances and subtleties of the subconscious mind and all of the uh, arguments in, involved in uh, understanding physically or uh, metaphysically even what what is going on, you're taking on something uh, incredibly difficult, incredibly complex, and I think you're doing a very admirable job of getting a handle on it. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm, I'm impressed, and, and I realize this is some of the most difficult material anybody could uh, endeavor to deal with, especially uh, in the context of this materialistic uh, era in which we're living. Well, it requires 
a bit of you know sort of retraining your thinking a little bit to sort of uh, to sort of think in sort of four dimensional terms, but it's actually easier than it it sounds. I mean, I think it it, it sort of it's intimidating at first when you start trying to wrap your head around causality going in two directions or whatever. But um, I really think that it simplifies as much as that adds to the complexity. It's sort of yeah, okay, it adds a new dimension, you know, to, to human behavior and, uh, human psychology or whatever we want to call it, but it simplifies a lot of things and it, and it really brings this whole dimension of human experience that has been booted out, uh, by, you know, enlightenment psychology and philosophy and so forth. It's, it, it really brings that back a whole vast dimension of human experience, uh, and, and make sense of it, uh, very powerfully, I think. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's this, there's a kind of a, there's kind of an initial barrier, I guess, you know, you know, okay. Learning to kind of think in terms of, of, of time in a more nuanced way. But, uh, honestly, I think in the end, you know, this, this kind of explanation really simplifies more than it, um, uh, complexifies i guess well eric wargo uh, once again thank you for being with me this has been a delightful and informative conversation and and i look forward to a future discussion in which we can get more into the science of that would be great i'd love that mm-hmm.